Welcome to Automail Terrace Radio TV, where lifelong Catholics. You know what we do is all for free and for our love of Jesus Christ and for our Holy Mother, the Church. And we'll defend our Holy Mother, the Church. Today we're going to be doing a program on Opus Dei, thanks to David Yellow. And it will be coming from the book, The Power and the Glory. And uh, coming from the chapter, The Village. And we welcome Brother Alexis to the program. Thank you, AJ, for having me on Automilla's Taurus Radio TV for this series of shows where we mine tidbits of information from Yallop's two books. One, The Power and the Glory, the, Inside the Dark Heart of John Paul II's Vatican, and um, in the in God's name, which was on the assassination of John Paul I, and we're working our way towards that. <laughs> um, this is going to be an interesting program. We've touched about Opus Dei before, so AJ, for people who don't know, just basically, what is Opus Dei? When were they founded? Who founded them? Yeah, so they were founded by Jose Maria Escriva on October second, nineteen twenty-eight, in Madrid, Spain. According to Escriva, on that day, he experienced a vision in which he saw Opus Dei. He gave the organization name Opus Dei, which mean, which in Latin means the work of God. Um, Opus Dei was only open to men, but in 1930, Escriva started to admit women based on what he believed to be a communication from God. And... Um, Opus Dei, according to him, was to help ordinary Christians to understand that their life is a way of holiness and evangelization. Um, yeah. Okay. So, like we did our show yesterday on the real <laughs> unmasking of John Paul II, uh, Escriva is also another fake saint of the post conciliar period. What most people don't know is before he founded Opus Dei, he lived seven years in a rectory with a homosexual. And he showered every morning, which is what homosexuals have to do after they do what they do. <clears throat> and in that age in Spain, to shower every morning was a sign that you were a homosexual in an active relationship. And homosexuals um, are involved in what they're involved in because they have daddy issues. And so they want to take it out on other men by dominating them, controlling them. And so Opus Dei is uh, absolutely maniacal. Uh, mind control, behavioral control organization that targets young men and turns them into uh, puppets and robots of their male superiors. Mm. So a lot of homosexuality goes on in the organization. He tells his members not to take a vow of chastity and imitate Jesus Christ, like all the saints have said, because Christ gave us commandments, moral commandments, which we all must observe to get to heaven. But he also gave counsels, which is advice to get there easier. And for those who love him more, and that's the evangelical councils of poverty, chastity, and obedience. And these lead you to observe the moral law more perfectly. And uh, this sets your mind free and your body free from earthly concerns. So you can contemplate God and, and serve his people. And one of the grave errors taught by Escriva is that the council, uh, the evangelical councils aren't for everyone. They're only for certain people, and don't you practice them unless you're religious, and this is an extremely pernicious doctrine, but it derives from his mania of controlling people, because if they follow the counsel of Christ, they would leave his institute, and join a religious order, and they wouldn't be under his control anymore, but he wants to give them an idea of perfection that leads them always to be subject to him, and that's a sign that he's a fake saint, and he's of the devil. <clears throat> And there's, there are websites for ex Opus Dei members. And uh, so we're going to get into the dirt on Opus Dei. And we'll probably get a lot of flack from this, but this is the truth. Yeah. And where do you want to begin, AJ? Yeah, so under Pope John Paul II, Opus Dei flourished. If the Pope was not a member of Opus Dei, he was to its adherents everything they could wish a Pope to be. One of his first acts after his election was to go to the tomb of the founder of Opus Dei and pray. This organization has, according to its own claims, members working in over 600 newspapers, reviews, and scientific publications scattered around the world. 
as members in over 50 radio and television stations. During the nearly three decades of the Watiwa papacy, Opus Dei, the work of God, succeeded beyond the worst nightmares of its critics and op opponents. Its late founder, Escriva, courtesy of an Opus Dei investment of the sum of $750,000 placed by senior, senior members where it would do the greatest good in oiling the wheels as the source really of her achieved beatification in 1992 and canonization in October 2002. Okay, so this is not a fact Yellow invented. In 1992, it was, the, it was all the talk, I remember it, that Opus Dei had given nearly a billion to the Vatican to buy the beatification and canonization of their founder. That's simony. It's a mortal sin to accept money to canonize someone. It's a mortal sin to offer it. And uh, it's a worse mortal sin to whitewash it. So it's completely fake canonization. You shouldn't call the man a saint at all. Mm. It's offensive to God. Um, uh, the way you become a saint is you actually obey Jesus Christ. You love him with your whole mind, heart, and soul more than all other things, before all other things, and above all other things, as St. Bonaventure says. And you live a perfect life of communion with him in, in, in the thoughts of your mind, the acts of your will, and the sentiments of your flesh, so that you love him with your whole being, as it says, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole mind, thy heart, and thy soul, and thy strength. And that, and individuals who do that are so in union with the Holy Spirit that God works miracles through them to proclaim to the world how they are his friends because they're so humble, you wouldn't know it. They don't go around saying, I'm holy. And uh, they don't claiming they have visions. So, um, yeah, that's really bad that they had, that they paid 750,000 for the canonization. It shows also that Esquivia's followers didn't learn any virtue for him. They only learned how to corrupt people with money. And that's not a Catholic organization, so. So granting of the personal prelature by Votiva in 1982 is an act that will eventually come back to haunt the church. Since 1982, Opus Dei has not been under the jurisdiction of the worldwide infrastructure of the bishopric. It can do as it wishes regardless of any objections in any diocese and is answerable only to its leader, currently the Madrid-born Xavier Escrivain, and through him to the Pope. When a number of Irish bishops in recent years objected to Opus Dei activities within their, within their diocese, indicated that they wished them to leave, they were ignored. In September 1994, when the popular Port Portuguese magazine Visil carried a critical article on Opus Dei, the magazine was subsequently de deluged with an un unending torrent of hostile and threatening correspondence. A short while later, the offices of Vicio mysteriously went up in flames. Since then, Vicio appears to be dis in disinclined to criticize Opus Dei. <laughs> so they're, they're a mafia. They operate a network of, of defamation and calumny. So if one Opus Dei doesn't like you, he will within 24 hours to everyone else in his organization in that part of the world and it will spread like wildfire and you will be on a blacklist. And um, they're very unsavior characters. I, I spent, for transparency, I took one semester of theology at Santa Croce in Rome, which is Opus Dei University, and I found that the faculty of theology was completely corrupt. Um, one, one of their faculty members claimed that priests who get to heaven are no longer priests in heaven. And one of his own followers, uh, Opus Dei student said, but isn't the priestly character forever? And he denied it. He denied that the priestly character, and that's heresy. Another claim that you can hope all men can be saved. And he asked if anyone would like to debate him on that. I debated him on him and defeated him in front of the whole class. I was basically then threatened to get out of the school by the dean of the faculty of theology. And then I was threatened by the rector and I had to write their head bishop worldwide and tell him what happened. And all I got was a very gentle apology. Was anyone going to be corrected? So at uh, uh, Santa Croce, they didn't, they actually precepted me in writing never to use the word heretic again. 
not in writing, but in video voice. I asked them to put it in writing. They realized they couldn't say that. So these people are totally immoral. I saw students coming out of faculty offices with, excuse my language, boners so big you could see them through the pants. And um, when you go to speak your <laughs> professor in theology, you really shouldn't be getting sexually aroused if that's what you were doing. So uh, the whole organization is just totally, completely corrupt. That's the university in Rome. They should have their best people there. And um, the mind control. Once a young man gets involved in this, he, he is uh, told to cut off all contacts with the rest of the world. He will not talk to his parents, his friends, his former teachers, his cousins, his relatives. He comes totally mind controlled. And I've seen people on, who are Opus Stay members, if they are seen in public criticizing something Pope Francis said, and they're seen by another Opus, they disappear. I've had Opus Day friends, they just disappear. Whatever happened to them, I don't know. And we'll get into some quotes here. It's, you kind of wonder what happens. Dr. John Roach of Oxford University, he's a lecturer there, a former member of Opus Day, called the society sinister, secretive, and Orwellian. And I totally agree with that criticism. On university campuses or in nearby cities around the world, Opus Day has established residents that serve as recruitment centers. The method used by some Opus Dei priests are again very uh, reminisc reminiscent of the tactics of more recognized sects. Their favorite targets are young adolescents away from home for the first time, disenchanted former members, and the admitted parents of lost children talk of mind control and an echo of Escriva's writings. And quote, this holy coer coercion is necessary. Com Compel it and trare compels them to come in. We do not have any aim other than the corporate one. Protestants winning vocations. When a person does not have zeal to win others, he is dead. I bury cadavers. So those words, I bury cadavers, are very ominous, especially when. Um, what was that quote from his maxims, AJ, that was uh, yeah, yeah. not not included in this canonization? I think you should quote that now so we understand what does he mean by I bury cadavers. Let us bless pain, lo love pain, sanctify pain, glorify pain. So this is obviously a sadomasochist. That's completely unstable mind. Uh, it's not the Catholic concept of uh, accepting your sufferings for the salvation of the world. Pain in of itself is an evil. It's a disorder in the sense of the appetite on account of some suffering. It is, we feel pain. Uh, God gives us the ability to feel pain so that we know that we're injured and should attend to our wounds. And um, we can feel spiritual pain or emotional pain when we suffer some loss or something horrible happens to a loved one. And the fact that we can feel these things is good, but the feeling itself is not to be glorified. Just as this way, you God gave you a body and a soul and a heart able to feel pleasure and joy. But pleasure and joy that you can feel, uh, things that are emotional, is not the end all, end all, end, end all, be all of, of life. And if you make it that, you turn it to a God. But if he calls people who don't have zeal in his organization dead, I bury cadavers, and then he starts saying glorify pain, you can probably bet that if you don't buck under in the Opus Dei, uh, you're told to torture yourself? Or do they, are their members taught to physically torture themselves? Yeah, they whip, scourge with anything, mostly change and uh, iron chains, anything with sharp things until uh, they start bleeding or blood is splattered across the whole room. Okay, so it's a, I, I wonder if they're doing this in common in the nude. <laughs> a lot of deviant uh, communities in the history of the church have fallen into this error. Almost all the religious orders at one time, there's some small group. St. Francis wouldn't let his when he learned his fires were wearing metal chains that gouged their flesh, he ordered them to take it all off. 
and they and they piled up 500 pounds of iron chain outside of the Port Zionkla there at Assisi, one of his great chapters. Because St. Francis understood, like the great saints do, who actually saw God face to face and know who God is personally as a friend, that in occasions of sin, you might have to use some physical pain to dampen the movement of lust or excessive emotion in your own body. And uh, it's a medicine that should be used sparingly. Even St. Alphonsus regretted that he used the uh, lash too much on himself and he got an infection in his lungs. So he actually pierced his, uh, he pierced his um, lung cavity on one occasion. So uh, it's not the end all. That's, it's only a medicine. But if you make it habitual rule, if you actually make it a discipline in the order for people you don't like, dissidents and stuff, that's abusive. That's sadistic, and that's contrary to charity. It's also contrary to justice because um, it's one thing to personally decide to do it in a moment of extreme temptation when you have to distract yourself by some uh, uh, grave method. It's a quite another thing to uh, impose it on other people so that you can sadistically control their minds, and their spirits, and break them, or even reduce their level of physical and psychological health so that they're more pliable to you. And um, there are so many complaints about this practice in Opus Dei, but it goes back to what I said about uh, Escriva and his perverted spirituality. Uh, I'm going to talk about how they regard women here. From okay, its good. very inception, Opus Dei regarded women as inferiors and assigns them mainly domestic work. They are at all times subordinate to their superiors. The sexes are strictly segregated and the women are disenfranchised. Although some women members achieve doctorates, their talents are frequently ignored. As Scriva wrote, women needn't be scholars. It's enough for them to be prudent. Much trust is placed upon modesty. The late founder would have had mixed feelings about the mere meteoric rise in England of Opus Dei member Ruth Kelly, who promoted in January 2005 to the post of Education Minister within the Tony Blair government. Okay, so Esquiva, for all his uh, falseness, shows the kind of man he was uh, up until the last month of his life. He would say to women who worked in his administration that if they didn't get in line, he would spank them. Now, I can see a perfect secular guy who really doesn't know the proper boundaries of speech and behavior to say to a, a, a woman employee who's as inferior, if you don't do what I say, I'm going to spank you. But that's not morally acceptable in any society, even <laughs> secular society. It's worse than a microaggression, and it is um, uh, because that activity I don't want to specify anything more than that. That activity can have sexual in, in, innuendo and does for uh, a, a adults because, well, I won't say any more than that for the young people watching, but no priest should ever utter such words to an adult woman. Be different if she was a 16 or 15 or 12 year old girl, okay? But this was an adult woman who's in like her 30s or 40s. And uh, he said it in the presence of others. So he had no shame no prudence, uh, no modesty, no discretion. It's a complete sign he had lacked all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. This guy's not a saint, he's a sicko. And, um, uh, or, uh, uh, or maybe just middling a person who really doesn't live the life of faith. And um, I wanna point out, just to correct some of the things here, make it very clear. In the Catholic Church, we don't teach that women are inferior. As human persons, they have the same equal dignity as men, as human persons. The only thing that one could talk about superior and inferior is one talks about the functions of the body, okay? And it is an ancient classical view of male and female that women would be called inferiors because they receive and gestate life, whereas men give. And um, 
in ma if you look at it from a modern biological view, you might think women are superior because actually what their body is doing is far more um, complex and um, far more uh, closer to the act of creation than a man's body. They also bear a bigger burden. And um, so there are Catholic theologians that hold that women actually are the most perfect form of humans that God has made. And that's why God made the woman last. If you look in the order of Genesis, you look at the primitive things God creates first. The last thing he creates is woman. And Our Lady is the greatest human person, and she's a woman. So <clears throat> you cannot say that women are inferior in a general sense. And it, it should not be said. It's, it's, it, it's um, offensive. So it is true, as we men understand, that women tend to be more emotional on a monthly basis than men are because, well, they have a, a movement of hormones in their body that is part of their ability to generate life and needs to be there so they can generate life. We men don't have that. And so there are certain days of the month and women can be a bit more sensitive or are outspoken, let us say, I'll say in the most mild way. But that doesn't make them inferior in some and actually gives them an opportunity to practice a lot, a lot great virtue. So, um, so um, yeah, yeah, um, go ahead. Uh, now we're going to get into uh, some things that are. Um, his idolization of Adolf Hitler. What? OK, so we have talked about Esquivar on previous programs, uh, mostly uh, our program on uh, Gladio in Spain. And we already mentioned the fact that he was had a very bizarre position that during the civil war in Spain, he didn't take a side in favor of Franco or the communists. He tried to stay in the middle ground, which is another bizarre example, like John Paul II wouldn't didn't told his fellow Poles not to fight the Nazis. But uh, how is it that he could ad admire Adolf Hitler? Okay, first these statements he made to Father Vladimir Velsman, a former Opus Dei priest who devoted 22 years of his life to, to Opus Dei. Escriva once remarked to his fellow priest that Hitler had been badly treated by the world opinion because he could have never killed six million Jews. It could only have been a million at the most. Okay, so there is a big debate on how many Jews Hitler killed and by what methods. Okay. And my friends in Israel affirm absolutely that even e the e uh, even Jews do not say that six million Jews were gassed by Hitler. Okay. Uh, they do there is the general assertion that six million Jews were put to death and the, the death records and um, were uh, uh, kept by the Red Cross indicate somewhere around 250,000 died in the death camps. And a good percentage of Jews in Nazi death camps died when their supplies in the last weeks of the war were cut off by either Soviet troop movements or American troop movements, and it wasn't really the fault of anyone directly speaking. But um, if you're the leader of a worldwide movement, before you open your mouth about anything like this, you should at least read some books. OK, and um, <clears throat> I don't see how if a person killed, you know, one million rather than six million, you can say he's been treated badly. Should you treat someone who killed a million people better than you killed six million? I mean, let's be serious here. Um, it's totally off the wall. So, um, like. Adolf Hitler, but Jose Maria didn't burn the books, but he did a, a different method of censorship. Books don't buy them without advice from a Christian who is learned and prudent. It is easy to buy something useless or harmful. How often a man thinks he is carrying a book under his arm and it turns out to be a load of rubbish. Escriva also taught that we are not all equal in the eyes of God. Next to the prayer of priests and of dedicated vir virgins, the prayer most pleasing to God is the prayer of children and that of the sick. OK, so on on books, it's kind of like a useless, you know, advice. 
if you're the kind of person that buys a book before reading it, you, you're just a foolish person. You're throwing your money away. However, often you there is value in buying a bad book. If you're an, a scholar of, of Islamic history, you have to buy a copy of the Quran. You might have dozens of copies of the Quran, different translations, versions, text sources. Uh, some people will call the Quran a, a bunch of rubbish. Uh, but that doesn't mean there's no value in buying and keeping the book. And this is true of anyone who's a true academic understands this. That's why academics are very sensitive to any idea that you should burn a book because it's evidence of something. A book, the book is there to record something. And um, whether you like its contents or not, it's a record and you can go back to it and look over it. You may disagree with it. <laughs> Some people, for example, write in books. They sign books, they underline stuff. My family, we have such a high regard with books. We, we have a, a, my family, we have a, a family library. It's over about 2,000 books. We have never written in a book. That's just absolutely, I would, you know, you cause me to faint if you see me, if you start writing in a book in my presence. So you should respect books. And uh, that's kind of like a silly advice given. He must think that everyone in his society is a bunch of ignoramuses that you make some off com comment like that. Or I don't even know why anyone Opus Dei would remember that comment. It's just not serious. Um, also, he tries to keep his members on message with advice on which newspapers to read, what radio stations to listen to, what TV channels to watch because of the secrecy, the precise number of media outlets either owned or controlled by Opus Dei is difficult to establish. One Opus Dei insider estimated that the media empire was at least as large and as far reaching as News Corp, uh, Robert Murdoch's multimedia organization. Apart from pushing a strong pro Opus Dei line, this media control also ensures a powerful degree of censorship that effectively and prevents any critical coverage. It was brought fully to bear on the issue of Escriva's beatification in 1992. A number of former members of Opus Dei felt morally obligated to testify before the tribunal in Rome who were considering the matter. Opus Dei influence was brought to bear to ensure that with one exception, only testimony favorable to Escriva was called. OK, so it's a completely corrupt organization. And while it is true to someone who's eight years old or 10 years old or 12 or 14 that a father should recommend that he or even prevent him from reading certain things or looking at certain websites or getting certain magazines, once you're an adult and uh, you are grounded in the way of virtue, it is still very useful to read publications that aren't good. I'm not talking about pornography. I'm talking about news things. So I, I publish from room.info. It's an electronic journal. I read old news sites. I'll read the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, uh, um, uh, the Daily Telegraph, uh, the Republica. I d because you can pick up facts in details of articles that might be pushing a narrative you totally disagree with, which really reveal what's going on. So there's a lot of value in reading opposition news. Even journalists all read the opposition papers. So just to make a, a standard thing, we shouldn't watch certain channels and do things like that. That is, goes back to his absolute total mind control that this guy's involved in and um, um, that this guy can't possibly be a saint. He's certainly not an academic. Yeah. So we're going to get into a testimony of a major whistleblower. Maria Carmen Del Tapia, an Opus Dei member of nearly 20 years. She had been for six years uh, as Cuba's personal secretary and major superior in the Opus Dei Women's Branch Central Government. She had been the first director of the press at Opus Dei headquarters in Rome. And in 1956, she had been sent to Venezuela as director of National Women's Branch. She remained there for nearly 10 years until being suddenly summoned by Monsignor Escriva to Rome. Maria, who had been told by Escriva that she had saved the day for Opus Dei, was told the reason for the visit was to give you a few days rest. 
Nearly a month later, Maria became aware that within the hot house atmosphere that passes for normality with an opus day, she had been secretly accused of various breaches of discipline, most notably allowing the women under her supervision to choose which priests they went for to for spiritual guidance and confession. Although allowed, exercising such a choice rather than meekly accepting an instruction is considered bad spirit. From that day on, she was under the Opus Dei version of house arrest and deprived of all contact with the outside world. The imprisonment lasted for five months. The mind games, the interrogations, the continuous mental cruelty, particularly the insults and constant rep repetition of how worthless a person she was, all of this is recounted with a with calmness and quiet clarity in her book, Beyond the Threshold, A Life in Opus Day. So if you don't believe what we've been telling you here, just read that book. And um, this this proves John Paul II, uh, without a doubt, committed sacrilege by canonizing this man. And that um, it is offensive to the divine majesty that anyone call this man a saint or celebrate mass in his memory or seek his intercession in heaven. This guy's obviously in hell. You, you can't torture anyone for five months, not for any reason. There's nothing in the gospel authorizing torture, let alone psychological or mental torture that is not permitted. Now, if you were a sovereign state like the Vatican and you thought a woman employee was a traitor, well, then you could hold her in detention for five months and interrogate her. That's just, but it's because you have sovereign authority. Escriva had no sovereign authority to act this way. And he probably violated her rights in uh, whatever, I guess, Spanish law. And um, uh, uh, she realized after all the years of her faithful service that she was in a cult. Mm -hmm. And her testimony is going to be valid until the end of time. And it will probably be used one day to overturn his canonization. So uh, thank God for Maria Carmen de Tapia. Now, from the point of her decision to allow its subordinates to choose their own priest and confessor, that is your right in canon law. The church is very sensitive to uh, the crime called spiritual enslavement, whereby a priest or a religious superior would want to have such control over subordinates that he won't let them get information to form their consciences about what's right and wrong in matters of their own personal interior life, whether spiritual direction or confession. And to intervene in that manner and command a subordinate to go to one confessor or director rather than the other is a grave crime. It violates the Code of Canon Law where it says, everyone has the right to protect that which is most intimate to their pers person. And there is no way a criminal can get to heaven because canon law is written in heaven, as Christ said, whatever Peter binds on earth should be bound in heaven. If you commit a crime in canon law and you don't repent of it, you're not gonna get to heaven. You're gonna go right down to the eternal jail. So, um, yeah, I wonder where they learned this. Oh, oh yes, yes. Opus State's membership is still not is still not vast, about 90,000. But its very high quality is a tribute to the sex ability and uh, the sect ability to handpick undergraduate at elite institutions. Within the Vatican village, Opus Dei probably has some 200 members, but the quality of their access and control within the Vatican would be very difficult to to better. Further, further afield in the U.S., Spain, Latin America, and U.K., and many other countries. They pop up again and again in positions of power and influence in areas where they have access to the ultimate wealth of the world, information and knowledge. These guys do not leave their Opus Dei commitment at home when they go to work. Very few openly admit their membership. When challenged on the secrecy, they have two responses. It is not secret. It is private. <laughs> or, of course, we cannot publish a list of members. That is contrary to the Data Protection Act and part of the member private life would be revealed if such a list were published. In the United States, Escriva's followers can be found in both the CIA and FBI. 
The recent head, the FBI, Louis Feet, is a member. I wonder if this is why the FBI was spying on tradies, because Opus Dei doesn't like tradies. They consider them rivals. And um, the Opus, under uh, the anti-papacy, Jorge Mary Bergoglio, all the Opus Dei priests were being ordained by Bergoglio, which, considering his bizarre views on sexuality, raises a lot of questions about Opus Dei. Some people saying that they, they're allowing Pope Francis to be as outrageous as possible because after him in the conclave, they're going to put one of their members forward to become Pope so they can grab control of the whole church. God forbid. So, um, um, yeah, um, now we're going to have to talk about an Opus Dei uh, double agent. Oh, yes. Hmm. Who is he? From October 1985 until his arrest in February 2002, we are talking about um, Bob Hansen. Oh, Hansen was Opus Dei. And secret information to intelligence services of the Soviet Union, later Russia. According to Louis Free, the damage he did to the country's security was exceptionally grave. And his betrayal con constituted the most tra tra traitorous actions imaginable. In return, he was paid by the KGB some $600,000 in cash, plus three diamonds, and had been told that a further $800,000 was sitting in a Moscow bank account in his name. He was strictly responsible for the death of several U.S. agents. In the words of another FBI executive, he sold the farm. The entire United States intelligence program for Eastern Europe had been compromised. Part of the money Hansen received from the Russians was used to finance the education of his six children at private Opus Dei schools. <laughs> Another part of the payment went to a lavish entertainment he shared with a stripper from Ohio. <laughs> when unmasked, Hansen insisted that the stripper and he had non-sexual relationship. I was trying to save her, he claimed. Unlikely scenario for a man who had who also secretly filmed himself having uh, relations with his wife so that a friend could watch the performance. Part of the software that he sold to the Russians found its way into the hands of the Al Qaeda network after the attacks on September 11. The February reassured Bonnie that they would not be putting any blame for the carnage in New York on her husband's traitorous activities. Given their ineptitude in the run-up, it is hard to see how they could be so certain. Ever the devout Catholic while working for godless Soviet intelligence, Hansen continued to attend Mass regularly and also make his confessions of sins. In the confessional box, he admitted that he was betraying his country and went into considerable detail. At least one Opus Dei priest initially urged Hansen to go to the authorities then rapidly changed his mind and told him that for his penance, he should pay $20,000 to Mother Teresa's charity. The penitent Anson duly sent the money, part of the Soviet pay, and as he was rotating his confession of several different Opus Dei priests, were fully aware that this pillar of the church was also de de delivering top secret intelligence information to the enemy. Eventually, his total reached over 6,000 pages. Okay, so you cannot absolve an impenitent sinner. So this, these Opus Dei priests committed a grave sacrilege in giving this guy absolution. Because if someone, it, the teaching of the Catholic Church is this, if a penitent comes to you and says they've committed a horrible crime that is punishable in civil law, you must, the priest must tell them to that he must report himself to the police and then bring a copy of his confession that he gave to the police and give it to the priest. And only then can the priest absolve him. Mm -hmm. And if a priest act differently, he is not only the, the confession invalid, the priest commits a mortal sin of sacrilege. He also commits a crime of complicity after the fact in a crime. And uh, though he is protected by the sealed confession, uh, he is abusing the sacrament greatly, and he, uh, he merits eternal damnation. And if the priest never undoes that crime, 
For example, let's say he absolves the trader and the trader continues his activities and someone dies from it. Uh, it's too late to be sorry for what you did. You're complicit before the fact in a murder and you'll go to hell for that one too. Yeah. So this is outrageous, but it shows that the complete moral formation of the clergy in Opus Dei is just totally corrupt, totally corrupted. So then we'll get to the, their global empire. Well, the potent mix of the super rich and the flower of highly talented university graduates, Opus Dei has created a global business empire that is frequently described as Octopus Dei. Like the IOR, the Vatican Bank is now largely, now largely controls. The sect never publishes annual accounts. In true IOR tradition, Opus Dei hides behind officer outlets, shell companies, and nominees. If there is indeed a life after death, Roberto Calvi and Mich M Michelle Sedona must be viewing in silent awe an organization that had for many years as its principal protector and chairman of the board, Pope John Paul II. Opus Dei's headquarters in the United States is a prop, a prop, a problem, problem Appropriate. located in mid Manhattan, not far from Wall Street. The 17 story building costing some $50 million is mute testimony to a global wealth built on the great deal more than ties of its 90,000 members or sole members. From an obscure humble beginning in October 1928 in Madrid, the work of God now has assets that Swiss banking sources have valued as 1 billion US dollars in rising. Hmm. So, and we discussed in our program on Gladio that they've gotten maybe two and a half billion from the CIA to push propaganda around the world through their, through their dozens, 60 or more news outlets. Yeah. In Italy during the 1960s and 70s, it was frequently said that if you want to succeed in this life, you must join the Masonic Lodge P2. In modern Spain and many other countries, there is a new version of P2. Just as secret, just as pernicious as Lucio Gelli's lodge, the same is true in Rome. The president of the Pontifical Council for the Family, Cardinal Alfonso Trullio, probably did more than any other man to persuade the late Pope that liberation theology was a major threat to the church a position that was directly responsible for the escalation of the carnage in many parts of Latin America during the 1970s and throughout the following decade. Cardinal Trulio is very close to Opus Dei. The late Professor Jerome Lejeune, who was, a, who was the lunchtime guest of the Pope, hours before ACA attack in St. Peter's Square, deeply influenced Carol Wotiba on this range of issues particularly birth control and abortion. Lejeune's family are France's premier Opus Dei dynasty. The beatification process for the professor has already begun with the late Pope John Paul's second's full approval. A Vatican source was one of the several within the Curia who were fully prepared to discuss the ever-tightening grip of Opus Dei at the very heart of the Roman Catholic Church. I was told, they control the bank, the information services, the council of this, the congregation of that. Look, every time there is a synod or a gathering, secret meetings take place. It's been happening since 1991 and, 19, and 1992 in the Via Aurelia. In particular, colleges, the European cardinals, even held one in Paris. Apart from the known cardinals, apart from the 50 or so Opus Dei members in place in the congregations, and on pontifical boards, there are friends outside across the Tiber. Those are friends who in 1986 were able to block parliamentary and ju juridical inquiry out into Opus Dei that the government and finance department asked for. Okay, now I can add to the facts of my experience in and around the Vatican uh, defending Pope Benedict is that Opus Dei was a, a co-conspirator in the ousting of Pope Benedict, who was cracking down on, on sodomy and pedophilia, even in Opus Dei. And they were totally behind the anti-papacy 
of Jorge Maribagolio and took lots of actions to suppress any news whatsoever which would show or demonstrate that Pope uh, Benedict was still the Pope until the day of his death. And uh, they went so far as to even have an Opus Dei member speak to me within weeks that I was in Rome. And how did they even know I was in Rome? So they have a pretty extensive network. And um, uh, the guy tried to pump for me for as much information. He insisted that I talk to him in a cafe right next to the Vatican so Vatican services could listen from a nearby table. So uh, it's a totally corrupt organization. If anyone says to you they're Opus Dei, run to the mountains, stay away from them. Don't tell them anything about yourself, your activities, and keep your kids away from them. Yep. Okay, shall we end it there, AJ, or she you want to keep? Yeah, let's end it there. And um, yeah, so uh, please like and share this program. Um, if any of our channels disappear uh, after this program is uploaded, uh, you know why. Um, yeah. Mm hmm. Um, so this is Order Militaris Radio TV signing off. Day is full. Day is full.